Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday morning Bible study of the Shiloh Baptist Church in Plainfield, New Jersey. My name is Charlotte Banks, and I am the facilitator for this Bible study, and we're live streaming our service today. Shiloh Baptist Church is located in Plainfield, New Jersey, and we are entering into, or actually are into, our 113th year serving the community. And so we're glad to have you joining with us today. I, um, I'm going to go and say up front uh, that there is still some lawn mowing going on, so hopefully uh, if you hear the sound, you'll know what it is and that it will go away soon. You know I have been praying that particular prayer. But anyway, we're live and we are going on no matter what. God's word will go forth. So again, I thank you for joining us. Uh, we're live streaming today. Our Bible study is in the book of Acts. And also, we have live streaming services for Bible study on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. That's in the Book of Psalms. That's conducted by our, our interim pastor, Reverend Sheila Thorpe. And of course, our worship services are held on Sundays, and they're live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. So we welcome you to, to join us for any of our live streaming services and to participate with us as we worship the Lord. I want to uh, just to say a couple things before we get into our, our Bible study for today. That this Sunday coming, July 5th, is the first Sunday. And for uh, those who will be uh, live streaming our worship service, we will observe the Lord's Supper at, after the end of the normal worship service. And so we invite those of you who are live streaming to share in that with us. So if you would have a cracker available and some juice, that could, uh, those elements will be blessed at, during the service. And you can participate in the sharing of the Lord's Supper at the time that we do it. So again, that's for this Sunday. I'm sorry, the... They're real close to the house right now, but anyway, um, I will try to rein in my tendency for distractions, get myself back on track. Also, in preparation for this uh, Sunday, we will have available, the first Sunday bulletin will be available uh, prior to the worship service. You can go online and download it, along with the e-newsletter. And the e-newsletter uh, will have with it any of the ministry announcements and events and all that are going to be taking place for the month of July. So just to make sure that you are kept up to date with what's going on, because we are still doing a lot. Shiloh is an active church no matter what. Our ministries are still meeting. Most of them are virtual, whether uh, by video or by conference call. But there's something going on that everybody can participate in. So be sure to download the e-newsletter, and you'll see a button for it right there on the website, as well as the First Sunday Bulletin. And they will, uh, as I said, be on the website prior to the worship service on Sunday morning. So be prepared for worship on Sunday. Have your cracker and your juice for our sharing of the Lord's Supper. Um, have your bulletin ready. Read the e-newsletter and be ready to go. Okay. I want to encourage you again, because this is the, the deadline now. If you requested a ballot by mail for voting in the New Jersey primary election, which is on Tuesday, July 7th, please mail it in. It must be postmarked no later than July 7th. But as I've said before, why wait? We don't want anything to get hung up with um, the holiday mail traffic or anything else. Go on and mail the ballot in. If you were not able, uh, uh, whether the deadline passed or whatever took place, if you are not able to vote by mail, then by all means, please do go vote in person. Uh, the polling places, uh, to my, it's my understanding, I believe, that uh, the normal polling places will be open. There might be a limited staff, but uh, plan to go and vote. It is so important. Do not write this off as just a primary, because many of the local um, offices, the, the local political races are 
their actual one, so you want to take place and participate. Uh, many mayoral candidates and council people for your your local um, care, your uh, township or city or whatever take place, but also the primary election. And you want to be ready. Think of this maybe like as your trial run for November. You want to be ready in November. You really want to be ready this November to exercise your right to vote um, so that in this country we can see our government reflect what the people really want. Okay, so that's the voting for, for July 7th. And as I announced last week, um, and also I, I know that Reverend Thorpe announced it yesterday, be aware that our Bible study will continue through the summer. Uh, in the past, for those of you who are, are new to Shiloh, in the past we've had a, a bit of a recess during the summer months, but uh, we will not be recessing this summer and will continue. So do not put anything on your calendar for Wednesday at 11 a.m. or Tuesday at 11 a.m. Plan to still be here and join with us as we continue studying the Word. All right, so I think that those are all of the announcements that I have for now. We'll go into prayer as we seek the will of the Lord for our Bible study today. Father God, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, we come to you, Lord. And Lord, we're just so grateful. You are just so kind and loving and long-suffering and patient with us, Lord. You just you sit high, you look low, but you're always available for us. You're just waiting for us to come to you. And one of the things that you really want us to do, Lord, is to learn of you. So we're here now in this time of study. And we ask that you join us, Lord, that you please be here and that you take control. That the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance the things that we've learned, that he'll prepare our hearts for what is yet to come. So Lord, I just ask you to be with us for all of those who are live streaming. Lord, just make the transmission clear. Make sure that they're able to see it and to hear it and receive what it is that you'd have them to know. And we ask this right now in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, as you know, we are in the book of Acts, and we are in the 21st chapter. And I had uh, made available on our website a few weeks ago two images that I had you download. Uh, and I started using them last week and I'll be continuing to use them. So we have one that's called Herod's Temple and it looks like this and I will be coming in closer when, when I'm referring to it. And there is another image called uh, Jerusalem in the time of Jesus and we'll be looking at this one as well. So hopefully you had a chance to download them and that you have them available to follow along during the Bible study. If you had not uh, downloaded them, you can just go on our website, shilohplainfield.org, uh, scroll down and click the button that says Wednesday Bible Study. Once you get to the Wednesday Bible Study page, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see these and other images, other things that we have used throughout the study. And all of those are available if you're trying to catch up with where we are. You can uh, get any of the things that are posted there as well as uh, look at the prior Bible studies. Any Bible study that you notice when you're on the Wednesday page, you'll notice it'll, it may say audio, video, and sometimes it'll have one that says notes. And if it has notes, then that means during that particular uh, Bible study session, I wrote some things on the board. And I've not used the board much uh, since we've been live streaming because I realize that it is difficult for you to see. Um, but any of the notes that are on there would pertain to that particular class. Okay? So now we're going to uh, begin our study. So if you would go to the book of Acts, and we are in the 21st chapter. Now we left off last week at the, we had, uh, we were talking about the 29th verse, uh, because it was, it's in parentheses, it's like a parenthetical clause that Luke added in to it, because the prior verse, 28, needed a little bit of explanation. So let's just, um, let's actually just 
start at at 27, just to get the context, and then we'll uh, go forward. And you recall the scene, we're in Jerusalem. Paul and the delegation that had traveled with him had delivered their offering to Jerusalem. That was uh, why they were coming. Every place that Paul uh, ministered on his journeys, he would take up an offering because the, the church in Jerusalem, the believers in Jerusalem, still were, were suffering even though the persecution may have died down some, they did not have all of the things available to them that some of the other churches. They were um, a poorer congregation than some of the others. So he would take up an offering uh, from the various other churches to deliver to them so that they may be able to get some of the things that they need. So he had delivered uh, the offering, and they had met with the elders of the church and with James, the pastor, and he had given his report of all the things that had taken place since he was there last, which means everything that took place on the third missionary journey. He gave a detailed report. And they had celebrated with him at just how the Holy Spirit had been poured out on all of these Gentiles every place that he went. And even there were Jews that were converted as well. And they were just really excited about that because the gospel was moving. This is what Jesus had said would happen and they were able to see it happening right before their eyes. And then they also shared with Paul that right there at Jerusalem, thousands of Jews had come to believe in Jesus as well. And then they presented him with a problem. You recall we talked about this. The problem that the Jewish believers had heard things about Paul, that they were really concerned. And so the elders had given Paul uh, what they thought a solution that would work of him joining with some other people who had taken a vow and completing the final rites of the vow the last seven days. So that's like, in a nutshell, where we are. So uh, verse 27 says, and I'm reading out of the NIV, when the seven days were nearly over, and this is the last seven days of the vow, this is when they do the purification where the, uh, the animals are sacrificed and where the hair, they cut their hair and it's burnt. That's the completion of the vow. Uh, so the, when the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia, and you recall anytime you see that, you can pretty much be sure that we're talking about Ephesus. So some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. That's it. They just saw him. And as they have done all over, we've seen it, they stirred up the whole crowd and seized him. Now, I'm going to come in just for a moment so you can see where we are. We, we did this last week. So I'm going to come in and try to get it straight. So, okay. So, recall, this is the temple. And remember, this is a huge place because this shows you the size of an American football field. You know, football field, 300 feet, I think it is, a, the playing field or whatever. But it shows you that for that, the women's court, in relation to that, so see, the, here's the women's courtyard here. So if you think in terms of this whole place, maybe being, say, six or seven football fields, you see it's big. So here, the temple itself has outer courtyard you see that you can see the steps and you'll see gate which is also just a door but you see that and then their area so here it says the gentiles courtyard meaning anyone who was not a jew this is as far as you could get and then inside there was a women's courtyard so women could be here but no more and then in here this is like the holy place so anyone who was not a priest could not go in here. So in this first area, once you're inside the temple, there was this chamber of the Nazarites. And this is the place where Paul and the other four gentlemen who took the vow were going to go in for the final completion of the rites. So Paul would have been going in and out of this chamber, in and out of the door, maybe. Uh, he was a Jew, so he could go in any of these doors that are for this outer area. Okay? So that's where we are. 
All right, so it says the, the Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple. That means that they were also inside the temple. And they stirred up the whole crowd. So anybody that was in the temple, they started making a big disturbance. And they just got the attention of it, and they seized him. They snatched him up, laid their hands on him. Verse 28, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. And we, we talked about all these little charges that they laid out here in verse 28. We talked about that at length. And they say, this is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. It's like, lay it on. He does this, he does this, and he does this. So they were just laying it on. And then the, the, fin the final thing they said, and besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. That was like the final charge, like the last straw. So in verse 29, we see this parenthetical uh, verse, it's in parentheses, because it's, it's Luke saying to us, I need to give a little bit more explanation here uh, about this last charge. So he says, they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul, and assumed that he had brought Paul into the temple. And we talked about that on last week, of how these uh, Jews from Ephesus, they were there for Pentecost. They were there on the pilgrimage. And because they were from Ephesus, and for the length of time that Paul was in Ephesus, three years, they had probably seen Trophimus. He and Pitychus were Ephesians. So they had probably seen them many times in association with Paul. And so here now, uh, in the city, in Jerusalem, at some point, I think that they had seen Paul with him because I believe that once they knew Paul was there, they were following him around. It, when they saw him, it was going to be an opportunity for them to uh, kill him. You know, it was like, oh, we got him now. And so they were going to follow him wherever he went, see what it was that he was doing, and find their opportunity. So as they're building their case, because as I mentioned before, I, I view this sort of like as a, a crime of opportunity. They saw him and they had seen Trophimus in the city and they said, oh we, can, oh, we can build this case. We can build it up. And I had talked about their cry for help, which was like utterly ridiculous, because it's several of them against Paul and they're crying for help as they're seizing him. So that's where we had, had left off uh, last week. And so now we are here in verse 30. And it says, the whole city, and I'm, I'm actually going to, to um, I think, read, read this maybe in a couple translations, but I'll start out with the NIV. The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. And as we look at this, the first thing I want to say is, when it says that the whole city was aroused, think about it. So they're in the temple, and they are starting this, this problem. They're arousing the people inside the temple first. And you can imagine how how the word travels. We've seen this. We saw it uh, in the, the riot with Demetrius in Ephesus, how just a hint of some trouble starts, and then the word goes out and goes forth. So what we're getting here is that there were people, who, let's say that they were in the temple with it when this commotion starts, and somebody ran outside into the courtyard. And then they started running out, and then people started taking off, and they're running down through the streets all through the city. They're knocking on doors, knock, knock. Hey, listen, it's going down at the temple. Come on down, we gotta see. Well, what? I don't know, but we gotta get on down there. And just sparking the interest. And we have seen this in the journeys with Paul, this mob mentality uh, that would take over, that it didn't matter what was going on or why, they were just gonna go because they had to be involved in it. 
So the, the whole city, and I'm sure that this is really not an exaggeration, the, the, all of the crowds they built up and everybody is running down to see what is going on uh, at the temple. Now, the, the, uh, when they grabbed Paul, they knew that they could not harm him inside the temple itself. Uh, you, just, you couldn't do any of those kinds of things. Now, you could do all, all kinds of stuff outside. But inside the temple itself, uh, you couldn't do it. So that's why they had seized him. Because if he were to stay in the temple, it's, it would be like a sanctuary for him. It would be a safe spot for him. So they had to get him outside. So that was the whole purpose that they were seizing him. And the, the scuffle at the, the door, that's, that's how I kind of see it. Because if, you're, if, you, if you can imagine the scene of a lot of people trying to grab somebody and dragging some place, you know, and there's too many of them to fit through the doorway and they're trying to move and maneuver but make sure they still have him and grab him and snatch him out, all of that's going to be like a big commotion uh, that took place. And the, the scripture says here, and immediately the gates were shut. Now, in the temple, there were Levites, uh, that's the priestly tribe, but the Levites had the job of securing the doors. They had the job of controlling who went where. So, say for the inner part of, you know, that this part, the, the holy part, they had the job of making sure that there was no one who was not a priest who got in here. So, if you were a woman or whatever, you definitely weren't going in here any of the men they would inquire, although they would actually know who was the priest from the dress. But they also were stationed at all of the other doors to make sure that anyone who was not a Jew uh, did not get into the temple. So they were on, on the door in control of it at all times. All right, so that's the one thing that I have wanted to point on to that. So when, when it indicates that the, the doors were, the gates were immediately shut, it's really more a sense of the Levites trying to close the doors. They don't know, they probably are not completely aware of the nature of all the stuff, like what should really be going on here. Probably just hearing the name of Paul, anyone in Jerusalem would have some idea of who he was and that he was going around to the Gentiles and they would have heard a variety of different stories about him. And then of course they would have heard what these Ephesian Jews were charging him with, the accusations they were given uh, here in the prior verse in verse 28. So picture the scene in your mind if you would. You got all of these people, five or six or however many of them, grabbing Paul and trying to get him through the door. And then they finally get him out, and you can see the, the Levites probably pressing up against the door to get it shut. You know, like, oh, let me make sure this is closed. He's out, he's out, and they're out of here. So that when the, the chief priest or somebody comes around and asks, well, what was going on at your door where you're stationed and you're in charge of, you can sit there and you can actually say, I closed the door and I made sure it was secure. That's Charlotte speaking. That was, that's in my mind. So... They got the doors shut. It was not like anything that was uh, a magic or whatever that shut the doors. They closed the doors because they were in charge of them, and they wanted to make sure that the trouble was outside, and they also wanted to make sure that Paul couldn't get back in, perhaps, because then they would be required to offer him uh, some security or, or sanctuary inside the, the, the temple. Okay. Now, I want you to notice um, one thing here. It, the way that the scripture is reading, it appears that uh, the Ephesian Jews have sort of like given Paul over to the crowd. 
okay, because it says that, you know, the people came running from all directions, seizing Paul. So initially, back up in verse 27, the Ephesian Jews had seized Paul. You see that back up in verse uh, 27, the last part it says, they stirred up the whole crowd and seized him. So they were in charge of Paul at, at that point. Then they lob all these charges, these accusations against him, and then the, the city's in an uproar, and the crowd comes rushing in, and it appears that Paul gets transferred over or handed over or snatched from them to now this mob in general. I'm thinking that they let it happen that way because they wanted to uh, put a little distance. They wanted to cause the problem and then step back. Cause the disturbance and then step back and watch it play out. They wanted to set it in motion and watch it play out where they could somehow absolve themselves of the guilt of having actually done it or caused it. So, one second, my screen blanked out on me. Okay. So, I just wanted to, to point that, that out for, for um, that portion here in verse 30. So, this is the scene. This, the mob is there now. We basically pretty much have like just a riot on our hands. And Paul is outside. The doors to the temple are shut but there is still uh, just the whole mob action going on. Verse 31. While they were trying to kill him. That's how the, the NIV starts. And pretty much all of the versions are like that. Like say the, the, uh, the New King James says, now as they were seeking to kill him. So you can see the intent. And it has, as I mentioned, is transferred now over from just the Ephesian Jews to the Jews in Jerusalem in general. And the news reached, excuse me, I'm back at NIV now, while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Roman troops and the fortress. So, we're going to look now at this one, the image that says Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. All right, here I come. Okay. This is the temple, okay, this big uh, area right here, and you can see how, how big it is as compared to uh, like the city. Here, this area right here, this is the Antonia Fortress, okay? And these four uh, items are turrets, uh, which are like uh, it, towers, so to speak, or lookout places. So if you think in terms of castles that you've seen, in some of the old movies from the, the, the Middle Ages where you see the castle and you see the high uh, turret peaks, that's what these were. And you can see from here, this Antonia Fortress, that was the name of it, was actually attached or, or right next to the temple. In fact, there were stairs, see these little brown areas here? They were actually stairways that would lead right from the fortress and land them right on the temple property in the Court of the Gentiles. The Court of the Gentiles goes all the way around that outside area. So the, the particular turret, this one that was real close to it, uh, was even higher than the others, giving them like a, a, a view of what's going on. All right, so that's the Antonia Fortress. Okay. I mentioned last week that Herod had built, excuse me one second, Herod had built the, the temple and he didn't do it so much for the Jews, although their, Solomon's temple had been built uh, and destroyed and I believe it was Zerubbabel had rebuilt the temple and that had been destroyed. So Herod uh, built this temple. 
not so much for the Jews and the worship and all that part of it, but for his ego. He liked building projects. He liked to build things. So he had built the temple, and then he built this fortress for the Roman troops. And it was to protect his interest of the building of the temple that he had made. So he built this temple. That's like his pride and joy. It's so beautiful. Uh, all of the things that are part of it, you know, it's like, Herod, I did it, I did it, I did it, and now I'm going to protect it because I'm going to build this fortress for the troops so they can make sure nothing happens to my temple. That's Herod speaking, okay? So, from the time that the Romans took uh, control of Judea in that area, this is long before uh, Jesus was born, they, this was like um, a jewel to them, this, this whole area. Uh, Alexander the, the Great had come through the area first with the Greek Empire, and that's why there's so much of Greek language. We're gonna, that's going to come into play a, a little bit uh, later on. And it's not far from Alexandria. We had talked about Alexandria um, on earlier on in the scriptures with Apollo, if you recall that. Um, but anyway, the 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 Romans had, had conquered it uh, after Greek. There was somebody in between there, but anyway, the Romans had taken care over that area, and Herod had built this temple. He built the fortress, and. The Antonia Fortress was large enough that a, a regiment of troops, I think that's called, I don't, military language escapes me, so if I don't have it right, just forgive me. No, a legion, a legion of troops, which was about 6,000 troops, could be housed in the Antonia Fortress. So get that picture in your mind as you're looking at it. We have to really always keep in mind the scale of things. This was not small. This was huge. The temple was huge. And the fortress was large as well. So it could house about 6,000 uh, soldiers in it. And there was always, he, Herod did this because there were constant uh, skirmishes and problems with the Jews. There were Jewish-Roman wars. You can read about those in, in your history books from before Christ was born even to afterwards. And there was all kinds of, of constant violence and insurrection. So they needed to have the soldiers there. Now, the, the fortress was up high. I, you can't really get a good feel for it from the image. But it was built up on, like, say, uh, some natural slopes or, or a high hill so that it was already high. And then so it was about 60 feet higher than the temple in general. And then the one turret that was directly overlooking the temple was about 105 feet. So they were way up there. And they could see the entire temple area. They could see all the courtyards and they could see everything uh, in the temple. So they could be able, I'm sorry, not in it because of course it had a roof. But they could see the whole temple area. All the different doors, all the gates, all the porticos, they could see all of that. So that if anything was about to go down, they could spot it ideally, um, before it got to be too bad. So, uh, the soldiers were on high alert because this was a pilgrimage festival. Recall, this is during the time of Pentecost. And Pentecost was one of the three Jewish festivals where Jews from wherever they were, Rome, Corinth, any place they lived all around the world, would come back to Jerusalem to worship in the temple for Pentecost. So they were already on high alert because there was more than just the normal local population. There were folks from all over in town. So the, their primary responsibility was to, to keep the peace, really. They didn't want to get involved in purely Jewish affairs. So it was something that the, like the law that the Jew had against another Jew of their own law. The Romans weren't going to deal with that. But if anything happened outside, if there was a riot in the city, if people were being built beat in the streets, that was their concern. And they never wanted word of any issues or any problems in their territory to get back to the, the emperor in Rome. Forget it, because then they would lose their post, if not their life. 
So they were already on high alert. So that when the the scripture said here, verse 31, while they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. So it's not as if anybody who was down there uh, at the temple area had to say, had to go find a soldier and tell him there was a problem. No. The soldiers, whoever was on duty in that particular turret looking out, probably was looking and they would see the whole crowd, people milling back and forth and going in and out. And then they would probably look closer. I don't know if they had binoculars in those days. I, I doubt it. But they probably had some means of which uh, they could look closer to get a closer look, trying to figure out what is going on down there by that door. They see the people running in, people coming from all directions. They say, uh-oh, it's about to go down now. And so they sent word, somebody got the, the commander. Now, the commander would be in charge of a thousand troops. So the whole fortress could was a, head, was a legion, and the legion would be 6,000, so there probably were six commanders. But the commander, probably overseeing this one turret area, had a thousand troops, and then his officers, uh, which in some places are also called centurion, each officer had a hundred troops report to the officer. Okay, so you kind of get a, a picture of the scope of it. So in verse 31, it says that the news, the latter part of the verse, the news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately, verse 32, uh, he at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. So he took with him some officers or centurions and soldiers, which meant each of the officers, each centurion was going to have a group of a hundred troops that reported to him. So this commander, he didn't mobilize his whole force of a thousand, but he mobilized, let's say, at least two or three hundred to go on down here and to see what was going on. Okay, now, it wasn't far, as I said, there were stairways, uh, a, two sets of stairs that led right from the fortress right to the temple, right on the Gentile court. So those soldiers probably hit it, hit those steps, ran around to the area because where the where the fortress was was back over in this general area, back behind here. So they would be hitting those stairs and running around because Paul was probably at this particular gate because it, he'd been going into this chamber of the Nazarites. So they ran around here. So uh, they it or whatever it is that, that they do, but they got around there quick. And I'm sure they had to be pushing through the people and so forth. But when the, when the people would see the soldiers coming, they would start to part, you know, make way for the soldiers. Nobody wanted to be the one who was going to impede the progress, especially when it's two or three hundred soldiers. Uh, coming to you. Okay. So then we're here in verse 32. He, and this is referring to the commander now, uh, he at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the NIV says the rioters, which is really what was going on by this time, saw the commanders and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So that also indicates that Paul was no longer in the direct control of the Ephesian Jews. He was now in the hands of the crowd. So the Ephesian Jews who had started all the problems inside the temple, calling out their accusations, they seized him initially in the temple. But once he was dragged outside of the temple, I imagine they just kind of backed up and admired their handiwork. Oh my, look at what we have caused. Look at this scene as the crowd is beating. And then the, the whole, you can sort of picture it in your mind, it's this whole mob mentality. 
and this one beating and throwing a punch and somebody else coming in and hitting and somebody else kicking all of this to it. So now they, the commanders, these soldiers come and so they stop because they didn't want to be caught red-handed beating and killing him. They wanted to try to, you know, act as if they didn't quite know what happened, how he got on the ground, how those bruises got on him or whatever. So they stopped beating him. That's what the scripture says, right? And verse 33. Uh, the commander came up and arrested him, him being Paul, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. So let's just... Um, well, I'll finish this. Ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. So I want you to look first at the order of this, the order in which the things were done. So the first thing that the commander does is to arrest Paul. All right, he came up and arrested him. And then he had him bound with two chains. And then lastly, he asked what he had done. So when he when he bound him, he would take the two chains would be there would be a chain around uh, Paul's arm, and then would also be chained to a soldier, one on on each side. And then the way the way that the the chains were. If Paul was going to try, if they were going to say try to walk, he'd have to kind of hold on. Uh, I don't know that there was, there was a connecting one or something was connecting, but he was taught, connected on both sides, and then he was holding on to the chains uh, if he was going to walk in, in order just to be steady for, for security, not security's sake, but just for balance. Okay, so let's, this is like a fulfillment, not like, this is the fulfillment of a prophecy. Let's just go up a few verses to 21, Acts 21, but verse 11. Because remember the prophet Agabus, when uh, uh, Paul was there and he was in Caesarea visiting with Peter and his daughter, not Peter, excuse me, Philip and his daughter to prophesy. Remember we talked about that at the time. So, uh, in verse 10, it says, After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Verse 11, this is where the prophecy is. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands, meaning Agabus' own hands and feet, with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So we talked about that at that time, and we talked about the credibility that Agabus had at a pro as a prophet from some time that he had prophesied before, and uh, the importance of it, and the fact that the very next verse in verse 12, when we heard this, this was Luke speaking, so it would have been when Luke and the other delegates, Timothy and, and Trophimus and Tychicus, all of those, when they heard it, we and the people there pleaded for Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So you remember when we studied that. So now, uh, going back here now to uh, verse 33, we see this prophecy come into fruition. So the Ephesian Jews had turned, basically turned Paul over to the mob, to the crowd, to those who were in Jerusalem. So the Jerusalem Jews now made sure, had Paul in custody. And when, when Agabus prophesied that he would be handed over to the Gentiles, the Romans are considered Gentiles uh, as well as anyone who was not a believer, not a Jew. So they have Paul bound, and the description is with two chains uh, that he's bound Agabus had used his belt, but we get to see that Paul is in fact captured and bound. And uh, at a later point, I'm sure his feet are going to be bound too. But it has come to into fruition. The prophecy has come to be true that he is now captured and handed over. 
uh, he was within an inch or whatever of his life had, had the Romans not come. But now he's handed over into their hands, handed over to the Gentiles. Okay, so the commander does the things in this particular order. And he's bound, and we see that prophecy fulfilled. So the, I, I wondered about that. I said, well, why, why was this the order? You, you know that there is a disturbance going on, the crowd, there's a fight. Why are you arresting the person who's being beat up? So well, this is my thoughts on it. I think that the commander, his first job, the job of the troops is to keep the peace. So he's going to try to calm the crowd. Clearly they have something against this person, whoever this person might be. So let me just, let's just arrest him, and that will kind of calm them down, that will appease them, um, because they were trying to kill him in the first place. So the Roman, he, the commander was going to, to do that, I think, first, for that reason. And then he needed to secure Paul. And the binding of Paul to the soldiers, I think, was a twofold thing. Number one, it clearly shows to the crowd that he is in custody. He's, he's in chains. He's going to be taken away from there. He's not going to be like just, we're standing there where he could be loose. But also, as like safety for Paul, he's got a soldier on each side, so they can't get to him to continue trying to kill him because the soldiers are right there. And then to uh, create... The third thing I think the commander was trying to do what, with all of this, or in this order, was to try to be able to have some type of an inquiry into what is going on. And so he did it in, in this order to do that. You know, so arrest him that appeased the crowd a little bit. Uh, put the chains on him that will make sure that he's not going to get away, but also provide him some uh, security from the crowd and then have the situation under his control, meaning the commander. He's now in control of the situation and can start his inquiry. Okay? So then we get to verse, uh, uh, well, no, we're still in verse 33. So he asks, well, I'll start at the beginning. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. We saw that. Then he asks, who he was, and what he had done. So, it's not completely clear. You read different versions of the scriptures, you'll get a slightly different picture. Uh, I think he was asking Paul who he was. Who are you? You know, like, what is your name? Where are you from? That type of thing. And then I believe that he may be addressing the crowd to find out what he had done. That, that's kind of my take on it. Uh, the different translations, some of them make you think that he was asking the crowd both questions. I kind of think that maybe he was asking Paul, who are you? Uh, and then asking the crowd, well, what has he done? Because clearly he had done something to them and they were all up in arms. Okay. Then, verse 34, the chaos starts. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. Does that sound familiar to you? You think you've heard that before? Well, yes, you have. Let's just go and look at it, because it's almost verbatim. Go over to chapter 19, verse 32. In Ephesus. How about that? Where these Jews who started all this problem here in Jerusalem now, they're from. And you know that they had been in Ephesus when the riot there uh, had happened. So in chapter 19, verse 32, and this is after the riot had started, they'd been running through the streets, they had snatched up Gaius and Aristarchus and went into the theater in Ephesus. Verse 32 says, the assembly was in confusion. Is that ever an understatement? Some were shouting one thing, some another. Those words sound familiar? Most of the people did not even know why they were there. My goodness. 
All right, let's go back now to where we were, Acts chapter 21, and we're in verse 34. I just had to go there because it's like, what? These words again? All right. So, verse 34, some in the crowd shouted one thing and, and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. So you can imagine the commander, somebody shouting over here, you're looking at them to see what it is that they said that Paul did. And somebody over here shouts something probably completely different. He looks over there and they're shouting all kinds of things all over the place. And he's probably saying, wait, 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 wait. Uh, all right, okay, forget this. And he's, we're, I'm going to take him to a different place. So he orders that Paul be taken to the barracks. That's just to be taken... Uh, back over here to the to the Antonia Fort uh, fortress that's also called the barracks. You, you remember we're here, so we're at here in the temple area. Okay. All right, so we're here, and they get Paul, and they're going to bring him around to get to here. And remember, they have to go up some steps uh, to get to the fortress. All right, so that, that's where, where we are, okay? Verse 35. When Paul reached the steps, that's what I was just showing you there, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. So picture this, probably the mob, they stopped, when the soldiers came up, they stopped beating it on Paul, stood back. The commander comes in, he has Paul arrested, he has him put into chains, and he starts the inquiry, what's happening, what's happening? So then the mob starts to get agitated as they start hear, uh, saying or hurling out the insults of whatever they're saying Paul is doing, they probably start to get agitated again, you know, and get riled up and, and start to get a little motion going. So then when the commander decides, I can't get at the truth here, I'm going to go over to the barracks, which means that they're going to start moving, going into a certain direction to get him out of where he was uh, on the, the temple property to get over to the fortress, the mob is going to move with him. Number one, they want to see what's going to be happening, where, where he's going and what they're going to be doing. And you can imagine they start pushing and shoving and somebody probably tries to get a lick in at Paul while he's in the moving because they, it's going to be the last lick that they could get in. So it says here, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. So they get to the steps where they've got to go up these steps to get to the fortress, and the mob is probably all around and surrounding him and pushing and shoving and kicking and punching, that they actually had to lift Paul up. Now remember, he's bound. The poor soldiers on either side, they're also bound to him. So they probably just pick him up, and, and a couple others probably grab the rest of his body and lift him up so that they can get him up the steps, because the mob was just so much out of control. And then in verse 36, it says, The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. And the, the actual phraseology that they use in the Greek was the same as what they were saying about Jesus. When, uh, at the time when they were offered the choice of whether they went to Barabbas or Jesus, and they said, crucify him, Jesus those same Greek words uh, were the words that were used here for Paul. So I'm going to stop right here, and uh, we'll pick up next week with verse 37, um, because we get to see um, Paul wanting to be able to address the crowd. You remember in Ephesus, he, he wanted to go into the, the theater where they had the mob was in there. He wanted to go in and talk to them there. He had no fear from that respect. He had no fear of his own life. 
uh, so much that he would like hold his, his uh, not do what he wanted to do. He wanted to go in and dress them. And you're going to see here that even after they were beating him and everything else, he wanted to address them too. So we'll pick up there next week. And I do have um, a couple of prayer requests that we'll do uh, before we close out. So I want you to keep in prayer uh, Sister Judy McKinney. She will be undergoing surgery tomorrow. Just keep her in your prayers. Uh, and also keep uh, Brother Jean, her husband, in your prayers as well, as he'll be the one uh, taking and staying with her. Uh, all the other sick and shut-in that we have, we've mentioned Sister Inez McCrary and some of the others who uh, are still recuperating, some who are uh, perhaps undergoing different procedures or what different things that I may not personally be aware of. But remember, God knows all of those things. So keep keep them in your prayers, and you can actually just have a prayer to God to. Uh, for all of those associated with the Shiloh Baptist Church or in your personal life, that God will take care of them, and he will. I want you to also, uh, we have the 4th of July holiday coming up. Of course, it's going to be like no 4th of July has ever been for so many different reasons. And I just pray that everyone will be safe uh, in whatever it is that you do, whether you're just barbecuing in your backyard with your immediately family or having your neighbors over, uh, or just relaxing. Just be safe and, and do maintain safe practices. We want to keep in prayer all, always our Shiloh leadership uh, as they are leading us through this time. Uh, and as the situation changes in our state here in New Jersey and uh, restrictions are lifted or in some cases put back in place, we just want to be mindful of the things that we are asked to do to, for our face covering, our social distancing, um, our hand washing and so forth. Keep in prayer the pulpit search team. It's an awesome task that they have, but we want we know that God has a shepherd prepared for us in his own time. It's going to be in his time. So, and that's what we want. We want who God has prepared for us. And so we ask that you also pray, of course, still for all of the health care workers, all the first responders, um, such a dangerous spike that's going on in our country right now with this COVID-19. So do your part. Remember, go and vote. Uh, stay safe, be careful, be prayerful. So let's seek the Lord right now. Father God, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, we come to you, Lord. And we thank you for this time that you've given us, Lord. We thank you that we have the scriptures, that we have your holy word available for us to look at. Uh, in the times that we're studying, Lord, they didn't have the scriptures. They didn't have it as a reference point that they could go back and see what had occurred. So as they're going through it live and we're going through it live with them, Lord, we get to appreciate uh, how much it is that you have said and how fortunate we are to be able to have your word. And so, Lord, we, we are faithful in our Bible study because we know that you want us to learn of you and you've given us what we need to have. And so Lord, we just pray that you continue to be with us during this time to open our eyes so that we can see all the things that are occurring, open our ears that we can hear what it is that you are saying to us. Because the things that occurred there have meaning for us in our lives today. Lord, we ask please that you just take control. We know you are in control, Lord. But we just ask that you just handle the situation with the COVID-19, Lord, with the pandemic, with the political situation, with everything. It is your world, Lord, that you are taking back. Those who might think they're in charge, Lord, you're going to, to handle that. And so we give it over to you, Lord. We're grateful for this opportunity. We ask that you just be with us and keep us for all the family. For those who are sick, for those who are undergoing procedures, Lord, be with the doctors. Guide their hearts, their hands, their minds. Uh, of all those that are going to be in the rooms who are caring, all those who are caregivers, be with them, Lord. We present our petitions to you, Lord, and we are prayerful waiting to hear your response. We're grateful, Lord, for your Son, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
squeeze in it. It began to rain, and so he had to go. That was good. That was really good. At one point, I think it's a point that I missed, he was actually up on the deck. Because they come up to blow, you know. There aren't really many leaves right now, but they come up to blow that area. And I said to myself, really? Okay. It's done. Wait, Paul really, really had to have dedication to put up with all the Oh my goodness. Oh. Well, it was a